Hello everybody, you're all so welcome to the channel of Eclectic Chiesa. If this is not your first time of being here now, thank you so much for coming back. Truly, I always appreciate it when you guys return. However, if this is your first time of being here, then I so wholeheartedly welcome you as well. I actually urge you to stick around because there's always a lot of fun over here, or either way, very, very interesting, so please don't go. My name is Vanessa Dancer and Roger Chewa, and today I'll be taking you through the history of the transatlantic slave trade and especially the post-after effects that we are still having or we are still to facing as one people as Africa in general so if you like this type of video just comment in the comments box below let me know what your thoughts are let me know what you're thinking I would really like to know your opinions on this one you can like this video you can share it you can give this thumbs up and show some love and until then you can just enjoy it I'll see you in a bit bye once you upon a very very sad time in the 1400s to be exact Africa faced its darkest era today I'm going to be taking it upon myself to take you through a history timeline which spans from the transatlantic slave trade period all the way to the present. Now slavery is a treatment of human beings as property, completely deprived of personal rights and oppressed. It is an inhumane act that has occurred in many forms throughout the world. But one institution stands out for both its global scale and its lasting legacy. The transatlantic slave trade is a trade which occurred from the late 15th to the mid 19th century and spanned across three continents, which forcibly brought more than 12 million Africans to the New World, today's United States and neighboring islands. The transatlantic slave trade began in the late 1400s with Portuguese colonies in West African countries such as Ghana. Now the crops that were grown in the new colonies, such as sugarcane, tobacco, cotton, they were all labor intensive and there were not enough inhabitants to cultivate all of the new land. American natives were enslaved, but many died from new diseases, while others effectively resisted. And so to meet the massive demand of labor, the Europeans looked to Africa. Now, African slavery had existed for centuries in various forms before colonization. Some slaves were servants with a limited term, and they had the chance to actually buy their own freedom, and others were more like European servants. In some societies, Slaves could be part of a master's family. They would own their own land and even rise to positions of power. But when white people came, offering manufactured goods, weapons, and rum in exchange for slaves, African kings and merchants had little reason to hesitate. You see, they viewed the people they sold, not as fellow Africans, but as criminals, debtors, prisoners of war from rival tribes. And so by selling them, kings enriched their own reigning regions and strengthened them against neighboring enemies. African kingdoms prospered from the slave trade, but meeting the Europeans' massive demand created intense competition. Slavery replaced other criminal sentences, and capturing slaves became a motivation for war, rather than its result. To defend themselves from slave raids and avoid being captured themselves to later become slaves, neighboring kingdoms needed European firearms, which they also bought with slaves. The slave trade had become an arms race, altering societies and economies across the continent, destabilizing the whole society. As for the slaves themselves, they faced unimaginable brutality. After being marched to slave force on the coast, such as Cape Coast Castle and Amida Castle in Ghana, they were shaved to prevent lice and then branded. They were loaded onto ships bound to the New World. About 20% of them would never see land again. Most captains of the day were tight packers, cramming as many men as possible below deck. While the lack of sanitation caused many to die out of disease, and others were thrown overboard for being sick or simply as discipline. The captains ensured their profits by cutting off slaves' ears as proof of purchase. Those who survived were completely dehumanized, treated as mere cargo. Women and children were kept above deck and were verbally and sexually abused by the crew while the men were made to perform dances in order to keep them exercised and to curb rebellion. So what happened to those Africans who did reach the New World? And how does the legacy of slavery still affect their descendants today is fairly well known. But what is not often discussed is the effect that the Atlantic slave trade had on Africa's future. You see, the Atlantic slave trade contributed to the development of racist ideologies. You see, the Europeans who preached a universal religion and who had long ago outlaw enslaving fellow Christians needed justification for a practice so obviously at odds with their ideals of equality. 
And so they indoctrinated a Bible section which speaks of the curse of Ham, which can be found in the book of Genesis. And so their twisted misinterpretations justified their act of slavery. Scientists such as Dr. James Watson, who discovered the DNA molecule structure, claimed that Africans were less intelligent, thus genetically inferior. Dr. Charles Darwin believed in natural selection and the survival of the fittest, making great efforts to justify this theory. Thus, slavery in America and Europe acquired a racial basis, making it impossible for slaves and their future descendants to attain equal status in society. In all of these ways, the Atlantic slave trade was an injustice on a massive scale whose impact had continued long after its so-called abolition. Millions of people across the globe were told the story of how America abolished slavery 150 years ago with the ratification of the 13th Amendment. The problem is the story is not really true. You see, they never really abolished slavery. The 13th Amendment clearly states, neither slavery nor involuntarily servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. The 13th Amendment did not abolish slavery, but it was rather reconstructed to keep it constitutional. And so slavery moved from the plantain to prison. So what we knew as an obvious slavery with chains is now the present sick mechanism of criminalization. Thanks to those six words, ever since the 1860s, states have been taking advantage of forced labor to perform a variety of tasks from road maintenance to making license plates. And in recent years, they've also licensed out that labor, allowing prisons to profit tremendously by leasing their prisoners to third parties. In 2015, two million people, most blacks, were incarcerated in America and are legally considered as slaves under the Constitution. As a result, they can and are forced to work for pennies an hour with the profit going to counties, states, private corporations such as Target, Revlon, Whole Foods, you name it. In fact, there are more black people enslaved today than there were back in the 1800s. This is for our ancestors in diaspora. But what about those who were left behind? Now let's go back to Africa. In 1944, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank were created after World War II to help avoid Great Depression-like economic disasters. The World Bank and the IMF are the world's largest public lenders, with the bank managing a total portfolio of $200 billion and the fund supplying member governments with money to overcome short-term credit crunches. Now, These institutions make it their business to identify countries who have loads of natural resources such as Congo, who has an overload in coltan, a mineral that we use for cell phones, laptops, plane, etc. Ghana has an overload of cocoa, which we use in chocolate. Sierra Leone has an overload in diamonds. Nigeria has an overload in oil, and etc. Every African state has an overload in some mineral. And notice I just merely mentioned 4 out of 54 African states. Yes, Africa is enormously wealthy. So IMF and the World Bank then arrange huge loans for them with ridiculous interest. But the trick is, the money never really goes to the country. It mostly goes to their own corporations to come to the country and develop it. Building infrastructures and unnecessary franchises such as bring KFC in the middle of a village where it's not needed. Knowing it is most likely that the country won't be able to pay back, it is a stipulation in the lending contract that a big percentage of ownership of the natural resources is then transferred to these institutions as bail, and other resources should be sold to them at giveaway prices. And so this is a vicious cycle in which Africa remains. Any leader who doesn't obey the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the World Trade Organization, and etc. is considered a terrorist and must be removed, or let's just say assassinated. Even coup d'etats are sponsored sometimes. Think of situations like Dr. Nkrumah and Gaddafi. Yeah, it can get that nasty. So even though slavery as we know it is not really noticeable to everybody these days due to the governmental control of media, news broadcasting, newspapers, radio, who all tell a certain version of the truth that benefits them and thus also lie by mission by keeping the whole truth from the public. 
which in turn causes miseducation by feeding the masses misinformation that we are in fact still in slavery. We need to be physically, psychologically, socially, and economically free to gain true freedom. And freedom starts with knowledge. So it starts with you, it starts with me, and it starts right now. So let's get busy. Well, it seems as though we have reached the end of this video. I hope you liked it, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned quite a bit. This video actually comes with an article about the transatlantic slave trade and all the effects that we are still seeing as people today. You see, our forefathers, our ancestors, people such as Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, Toure, Dubois, Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, those were all people who knew and understood the importance of uniting African states together to come together and to develop and create social systems and economical systems that will work in our benefit. If I would have told you that Africa is the wealthiest continent on the face of the earth, would you believe me? And yet that is actually the case. In this article, you will find everything that I'm talking about right now, but if I talk about it right here, right now, it will be too long of a video, so you can just click on the link below. Until then, you can just take care of yourselves, be kind to one another, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.